see everybody. I'm not sure if my screen's going to come on or not. It seems to be a little um, unwilling this morning, so I may have to... So my slides may make it. They may not. I'll, I'll have to kind of glance around and see if I'm making it around there or not. But if I get behind, you can just yell at me or something and tell me to speed up. Um, you can do that anyway. Just yell at me. I don't mind. I want you to kind of think for a moment um, about this scenario, okay? I've been thinking about this scenario a lot lately, and um, I have to say it's, it's challenging. It's a challenging thought. Um, but here, here's the scenario. I want you to imagine that you live in a world without Jesus. Now, I'm not just saying that you live in a world that believes in Jesus and you've chosen not to believe in Jesus. I mean, I want you to imagine living in a world that has never heard of Jesus, that Jesus does not exist in the world in which you live in. And now, as you think about that and, and just kind of that ponder that idea, what would life be like without Jesus in the world? What would life be like? Um, I would like to suggest to you that it is impossible for you to truly understand what that would look like. It is impossible for you to understand or to even begin to imagine what the world that we live in right now would be like without Jesus. In fact, some of the things you may not even, even thought about that have been impacted by the advent of Jesus, Jesus coming into the world, are, are things just like our medical system. You know, you, you may not have thought about that, and you may think, well, that's just the way things are. You know, we have medicine, we have doctors. Anybody can go to a doctor, anybody can receive medical care. A lot of that is a product of Jesus in the world. Things like just, just our, our structure of government. You know, we may not think about that all much, but our structure of government has been incredibly impacted by the coming of Jesus and Christianity becoming a dominant religion in the world. That Jesus had a direct impact on things like our government and things like our medical system or, or schools. A school is something that we take for granted, right? We have schools. We have our kids go to school. We think, well, yeah, I mean, of course my kids got to go to school. That has not always been that way. There was a time when if you had status, if you had money, if you had means, then yes, you were privy to things like education and medicine. But if you didn't, then you would not have access to those things. That only the elite had access to the things that we take for granted. And so it's really impossible. Now, is it possible that over time as a society we would have developed you know, to a point where we would have done some of those things on our own? Yeah, maybe, but not likely. The amount of compassion and the amount of love and the amount of willingness to take care of people who are not able to take care of you <laughs> that we see in a lot of the things we take for granted on a daily basis, a lot of that is because of Christ's influence in the world, that Jesus brought about change, and that change is something that we experience but we just take for granted. Now, Thinking about that, I want you to think about that because when the apostles went out to preach, they were preaching to a world that did not have Jesus. It wasn't that they didn't know him. <laughs> they had never heard of him. Jesus had not impacted the world in which they lived in in such a way that we experience today that they did not have a clue about anything about Christ and his influence. The things that the, pre the preachers were preaching, the things the apostles were teaching— were so foreign to them in the world that they lived in. But that's the environment in which the apostles went. Now, we're going to be talking about the church in Colossae, the book of Colossians, one of my all-time favorite books uh, in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, I, I love James, and I'm so glad we got to study that, but I really love Colossians. It's such a beautiful uh, letter. But a little bit about the background of Colossians, it was not a church that Paul started. Okay, it's actually a church that a man by the name of Epaphras began as a minister or uh, an evangelist. And so Paul and Epaphras were, were people that worked together, but Paul wasn't the one who began this church, like we see in a lot of Paul's letters. But the apostles heard about them, 
and, and we're encouraged by them. But this is kind of this grassroots movement of an evangelist just going out into a pagan community, preaching Jesus, and a church having its beginnings. And these people responded powerfully to the message of Christ. Now, I want you to kind of listen to what Paul is saying here for just a minute um, when he's talking about the brethren here in Colossae. He says in verse 3, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. And so even though Paul didn't plant this church or he wasn't involved in in the beginning, um, he certainly heard about them. And it was such an encouragement to them. And I imagine it was. I imagine just hearing that, that somebody like Epaphras could go and preach the gospel and a church could have its beginnings in a pagan world, that that was a monumental moment in the minds of the apostles. That they realized right then and there that the gospel will continue, that it will spread, that even when we're gone, there will be people who will come in and preach the gospel and the gospel will continue to bear fruit. And that must have been a moment when the apostles realized this is God's purpose and his plan. That it's not going to be about us. It's not going to be about the apostles going in with power and authority to to plant churches all throughout the region. But it's going to continue with average people who have an average message about the gospel of Jesus. And they're going to go in and lay that foundation and churches are going to have their beginnings. Look at verse 5. He says this, because of the hope, Paul says, laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Now, Paul lays down several principles here, but it's just really just this um, these words of encouragement. It's one of the things that makes Colossians so powerful is, is it's fast-paced, but it's incredibly encouraging. Paul is so excited about this group of people. He's so excited about this, this movement that this congregation has had its beginnings, but he's also excited about their faith. He's excited about their love. He's excited about the change. Now, mind you, this is a group of people that grew up in a pagan world that didn't have these things. And so now they are exhibiting Christ-like character traits that were not part of their culture. They weren't part of their society. And so this is a whole community within a larger community that is becoming Christ-centered. And Paul talks about several things. He says there's this hope that is laid up for you in heaven. That's, that's our motivating factor. That's their, if you would say, their motivation. He said, that was brought to you by the gospel, the truth that was preached to you. It didn't take any special program. It didn't take anything miraculous per se. It just took a message of hope. And they committed to that message. And they put their faith in that message of the gospel. And he says, but it's it's a hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Now we've talked about this before, but that idea it's not just a a casual, well, I kind of hope it goes this way or that way. You know, we we kind of use hope in that framework, but when the Bible uses hope, it's it's most often a confident expectation. It's to say, I know it's going to go this way. I know that life will change. I know things will be better. I know that God has a plan and a purpose for me. I know. And Paul says that that confident expectation is laid up for you in heaven. That is a heavenly reality that is affecting your earthly life here on this earth. They have come to understand after hearing the gift of God, the grace of God, the, the charity of God. For all people so that they can become part of the family of God through the person of Jesus. And But he also talks about the fact that this gospel is making its rounds. You know, it, It's moving along. It's spreading throughout the world and quickly taking root in several different com- communities of believers 
that are beginning to realize and come to the knowledge of Jesus and they're growing in their faith and they're teaching their children and they're teaching their family and teaching their coworkers and it's just going and spreading. And Paul says, yes, it's been doing that. It's been doing that. It's been growing and it's been spreading and the fruit of the gospel is so evident and that they are a result of that. That's why Paul is using this language. But he also says not, not just that. It's not just that the fruit of the gospel is spreading throughout the world, but the fruit of the gospel is also changing you. Since the day you heard of it, since the day that you heard and understood the grace of God and truth, it has begun to change your life. Now, I also want to preface this with the idea that this wasn't necessarily a peaceful idea. Changing your, your worldview, changing how you live, changing your family's way of living was not going to be something that people were going to welcome. That they had their ideals, they had their their thoughts, they had their gods, they had their government, they had a way of raising families. They had a view on children. They had a view on the sick. They had a view on the poor. And then when you come in with your new way of thinking, the gospel way of thinking, and you show compassion for the sick, compassion for the poor, when you come in and you, and you show that even the little children are honored and respected by God, that when you start recognizing that and teaching that and moving that into a community that does not agree with you, you expect hostility. And that's what they got. We don't necessarily expect that because we have grown up in a world that has been impacted by the gospel of Jesus, whether we understand that or not. They haven't. And so this is rocking their world. And it didn't go well for a lot of people who lost their lives because of their faith that they have placed in Jesus, but they considered it worth the risk. Look at verse 7. He says, Just as you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Verse 9. Paul says, For this reason also... Since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. To combat any kind of disdain, any, any rejection from their community, any, any false teaching, Paul's going to deal with that also. There's certainly going to be some of that's going to come up in this community in Colossae. Um, Paul wants to encourage them and he wants to pray for them that they they remain or they continue to be filled up to be filled up with with knowledge but not just any knowledge it's it's not just a worldly knowledge uh, it's not just a knowledge that you get from a, an encyclopedia but it is it is a knowledge of his will the knowledge of the will of God what is God's will what does he want what is he trying to do through us? How is he trying to change us? And, and I like to think about it, and we'll talk about this in, in a little bit more, but I like to think about it as, as a kingdom within a kingdom. You know, you, you have this kingdom in which you live in, and we, we can call this a, a kingdom, the world we live in. We have this kingdom, and they have certain ideals, they have certain thoughts, they have certain ways of doing things, they have certain belief systems, what's right and what's wrong. And then you come along and you become a kingdom within a kingdom, which means that your thoughts are different than their thoughts. Your ideals are different than their ideals. Your right and wrong is different than their right or wrong. You prioritize things that they don't prioritize. You're different. And what makes that different is the person in whom you follow. Who is your king? And in this case, what this community is doing is they're becoming a kingdom of Christ within a pagan community, and they're different. And that knowledge of God's will is going to be the thing that fills them up. And that's what Paul prays for, that it, they're filled up with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, we've just spent a lot of time in James, and I'm grateful we're here in Colossians because Paul emphasizes um, a lot about knowledge for a good purpose because that's what this church needed to hear. 
James spends a whole lot of time talking about, yes, knowledge is good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to have knowledge, but it's not good to just be hearers of the word. What does James say? But we also ought to be what? Doers of the word. And so Paul is emphasizing the knowledge part. James certainly covers the, the doing part, and, J, and Paul doesn't disagree with that, I would say, not in the least. But he needs them to be changed and transformed by the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of the gospel, the principles of the gospel. Then again, things that we take for granted in our society, they're learning for the very first time. We expect people to be generous. We expect people to show compassion. We're surprised when they don't. We're shocked. You know, we, we say, see somebody who is, who is in trouble, and we expect people to run that way. But if we see somebody who kind of, you know, turns a blind eye and tries to avoid the situation, we look at them with disdain. That's not their society. That was normal. It was normal to look past the broken people. It was normal to look past the hurting. It was normal to cast out those who were sick because they were weak. That was part of their culture. Jesus is teaching them to be totally different people. They're teaching them to be Christ-like in all ways. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Listen, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Wow. And Paul, you know, this is... One of those moments where you realize how poetic Paul is, you know. I mean, a lot of times when we read about Paul and, and his writings, he's really coming down on the church for some kind of grievance or some kind of concern, and, and it's very serious, and he's, he's writing things out in that format, you know, and here's the issue, here's the solution, here's the issue, here's the solution. Right now, Paul is just pouring his heart out with gratitude for the fact that the gospel has produced fruit, not in not just in the community of Colossae, but in the hearts of these people, and they're being transformed, and he's encouraging them to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. To, to produce fruit as they increase in knowledge. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really where we need to be as well, as we increase in our understanding of Jesus, when we increase in our understanding of what it's like to be the kingdom of God, when we increase in our understanding of the will of God, it should naturally produce a kind of fruit in the world. But not just in the world, but Paul lists a couple of fruits we're familiar with. He talks about steadfastness. He talks about patience. He talks about joy. He talks about thanksgiving. Those are things that we expect from the fruit of of the Spirit, when a person lives a Spirit-filled life, then these are the kinds of things we would expect them to produce within their life, to be completely changed and altered people. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, Paul says, For he, for God, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness. You know, that's probably the world they're currently living in, the domain of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that is in darkness. But he rescued us from the domain of darkness, and you know what he did? He, he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. You know, I like to think about it as the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. You were once under the control of, of darkness and blindness, and, and you couldn't see and, and you were being led by the prince of darkness, whether you knew it or not. But now, but now you have a new king, and you're part of a new kingdom. And it's a kingdom of God's beloved son. And then he says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. That, that the blood of Jesus, that Jesus has... Through him we have redemption. We've been redeemed. 
But we also have this beautiful forgiveness of sins. Now, we, we often put those two together as the same thing, redemption, forgiveness of sins. Paul separates the two. To, to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus, it's more than just having your sins forgiven. You know, that's, that's basically the idea. But to have a redeemed life, to have a changed life, to have, have a new life, a new kind of life, to be, to be taken away from one life that is destructive and, and uh, self-centered and, and you have been purchased from that, you've been brought out of that, You've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. Having your sins forgiven, yes, but living a life that is contrary to the life that you once lived because of Jesus, because of redemption, because of forgiveness. We have that kind of relationship with God. Now, Paul will, will jump into this, and I think this is where He's, 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 it's a hymn, if you will, or a poem, depending on how you want to view that, but it is a poem about Jesus. And so this is part of their understanding, and it's part of our understanding and, and some things we know, but, but knowing this is going to change your world. It's going to change your life. Knowing more about who Jesus is should change everything about you. That, that Paul sees it so important that we grow in our knowledge and our understanding about the will of God and the nature of Jesus because good doctrine, good theology will change your life and it will change your world. That's why Paul is so adamantly opposed to false doctrines and false beliefs and false theology. It's not the only reason, but it's a main reason because it alters and it changes the reality of the knowledge of the Son of God. And when we change who Jesus is, then we change the kind of fruit that is being produced by that kind of teaching. So let's, let's dig into this. It's really good. Listen to it. Paul says, he is, that is Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. John addresses this in his letter, uh, his gospel as well, to talk about that nobody has ever seen God, but we have seen the Son. You know, we've never been in the presence of God because that's a really dangerous place because God is holy and we're not, but but we've seen the Son. We've heard about the works of God, but we didn't actually understand them until we saw the Son. That He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now that may have to do with the new creation. The fact that Jesus has been raised from the grave to walk forever in life. That He is the firstborn. That's a lot of times how Paul addresses Jesus. The firstborn of all creation. They needed to see Him this way. They needed to recognize who Jesus was. They needed to have a better understanding of him. Look at verse 16. It says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers, authorities. All things have been created. Now listen, through him and for him. He, he's not just the agent of creation, but he is the reason for creation, that all things have been created through him and for him, that Jesus is creator and he is creator of all things. Everything that you see, now they too lived in a world to some degree that was impacted by the existence of the third person of the Godhead, second person of the Godhead, excuse me, however you want to measure up the trilogy. Um, that's that's a whole that's a whole another ball of wax right there, uh, but nonetheless, when you're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we recognize that all things exist because those three exist as one. And they didn't understand that. They they had other views about the, how the world came to be. They had other views about why things were the way they were. They didn't have a clue. But now, through the knowledge of Jesus, they're coming to realize that everything they do, even the breath that they take, the fact that they exist, the world in which they live in, is a product of God, the Son, and the Spirit. That all three working together as one God, bringing about the reality. And Paul emphasizes Christ as being the one through whom and for whom all things are created. Look at verse 18. 
Paul says this. He says, he is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Everything. First place. That's interesting. Do we, do we put Jesus in that place? Now, he already, he's already there. Okay, that's what Paul's saying. Whether, whether you put him there or not, he's there. But my question to you is, in your life, do you put Jesus in that place? Do you have Jesus in his rightful place? Is he first in everything? Is he first in every decision that you make? Is he first in every consequence that you encounter in life? Is he first every morning when you wake up in the morning? Is, is his desire, his life, his purpose first in your life? Because he's already there. He, he already holds that place. There is nobody else who holds that place. But the question is, are we allowing him to have that place in our world? The Colossians needed to think about that. We need to think about that as well. Look at verse 19. He says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. That's the kind of understanding that the Colossians needed. Now, they, they've had a glimpse of that. They, they've been taught. They've, they have an understanding. But Paul wants them to be mindful of these words. To recognize that, you know, there is another opposing view. There is another opposing view in the world. That opposing view is that somebody else created the world. That there's another purpose for the world. In our world, it's, it's the world created itself. But there's always something out there that's trying to tell us that everything that we see, everything that we do, everything that we have is a result of something other than God, other than Jesus. And if we live a life like that, if we live a life that says that everything you see, everything we have, everything we do is a result of chance, how do you think that particular doctrine will alter and change how you live your life? What manner of walk will you walk if you believe that as a primary? You have nothing to, to lose, right? There, there's no standard. There's nothing, nothing to gain. There's nothing to lose. You, you have a tendency to view yourself more highly than you ought to. You have no standard or model to go by because everything is by chance. So you live your life by chance. But as Paul is pointing out to this group in, in Colossae, what if, and as a reality, what if the whole world was created through and for a man by the name of Jesus? And what about that man that he be God, that he came in the flesh, that he offered his own life humbly on a cross so that he could bring you into the kingdom, that he is king, so that he can reconcile you to the God of all things, so that he can bring you together as a family through compassion and love being the main model for our attitude and our behavior and our decision. What if? What if that was the reality? What if instead of things happening by chance, as we often hear it, things happen by purpose? And if things happen by purpose, how will it change your life? How will understanding Jesus in light of the reality of what Paul is displaying in this hymn change your life? It should change everything. It should change everything. There is nothing that you do, nothing that you say, nothing that you can do that will not be touched by the reality of the person of Jesus. Now, Paul is going to continue building this up, and he's going to continue talking about what it's like to have this kind of living faith. And that's what we're going to be continuing to do this month. But there's a couple of things I want to, I want to leave with you with. This one right here. Paul says, 
that harmony, in essence, the world, harmony, peace, comes by Christ, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That, that is a passage that I want you to think about, I want you to meditate on, and I want you to consider the ramifications of the peace that comes through the blood of his cross. Also, this is verse 14. It says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And that's another passage, another thought I want you to, to meditate on and think about this week. That in Jesus, we have redemption, we have the forgiveness of sins. Now, the bottom line is this. The gospel of Jesus is enough. It's enough. It's enough to change the world. It's enough to change you. It's enough. It's what we need. And we need to read and study that and learn it and become better acquainted with the reality of who Jesus is. Maybe there's somebody here this morning, maybe you have not fully committed to the reality of the person of Jesus. And, and maybe you need to, or maybe you need to recommit yourself. We talked about this morning in Bible class about rededicating. Maybe that's what you need. Whatever the case may be. Maybe you have never put your faith in Jesus. You haven't been baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins to become part of the church in which he is ahead. Whatever your need is this morning, if you would please come forward as we stand and as we sing.